Digimon Digital Card Battle. The name alone details quite a bit about this title, but what it doesn't tell is that it's a sequel to the Japan-only Digimon World Digital Card Battle. While its Japanese title was Digital Card Arena, during localization it adopted the subtitle of its predecessor and dropped World from the name, which was confusing considering Western releases typically did the opposite. There's not much to say about the first game as both are quite similar, and I'll be balls deep in the second very soon, but to justify the fact that I did a full playthrough of the first game, I'll give a quick rundown of the differences. It takes place on the same file island from the original Digimon world, and you even play as the same yellow... Muppet boy. The narrative shares a lot of the major events, but relegates all progress to card battles, as well as item trading quests and collecting a rare set of seven cards, called the Sevens. Bits are rewarded for winning battles and can be used to buy boosters from shops, but the game contains far fewer cards than the follow-up title, making deck construction, as well as duels, comparatively constrained. There's also a cosplaying Agumon, and he's an odd pick given that the last time we saw him, he was a banker. And that's about it. It's a solid title, but would be outdone by the follow-up. Speaking of, I had a challenging time replaying Digital Card Battle, the uh, second one, and as much as it is a fantastic card game, it's a stunted video game. For starters, the story's practically non-existent. The major events consist of moving through combat-focused gyms and battling their leader to unlock the next destination. It's not long before Digimon start getting a little crazy, and it's soon revealed that they're being controlled by the dreaded Digimon Emperor. You give him a bit of a slap, and because you bested him in a card game, he vows to never again be evil. I thought this was Digimon, not fucking Yu-Gi-Oh. Haha, <laughs> got him! Then the gym grind continues, and Digimon start reciting other schizophrenic babble about a chosen one who will become a cardmaster and defeat a mysterious prophesized figure. Eventually, you hit what appears to be the final stage, but upon completion, the screen colors become inverted and core functionality fails. It's vaguely reminiscent of that time the 12-year-old traced your IP through Xbox Live. That's right, you've been hacked again. But this time, you're straight, and your mum hasn't been fucked. The mysterious figure makes his appearance, and it's revealed to be the master hacker known as A, or Analog Man. Yeah, the final boss from the original Digimon world's back, and as a virus or something. He challenges the hero to a battle, despite having full control of the server, and hacks himself a nice little bullshit deck full of cards you stand little chance against. Since the option to leave is disabled until his defeat, there's no chance to acquire extra cards, so you either have to make do with what little you have, or reload a previous save in order to prepare better. Upon his defeat, a Rosemon reveals that the card game was a counter-offensive she implemented, because she's actually a personification of the defense system, and not a real Digimon. The system's sole purpose is to imprison Analog Man after he's defeated in a card match, and then it deletes itself on some shit. But it's okay, because no one's ever really gone. This scene vividly sticks out in my mind as the defining moment of digital card battle, but one of the core functions it disables is saving. Which, I guess, makes for an authentic hacking experience, and doubles as a softlock prevention method as you're really unable to do anything, but potentially requiring a player to lose progress is a bit cunty. In fact, it's very cunty. It draws into question how much of the video game safety net you can dissolve in order to craft an immersive, memorable scenario. These events do ask a lot of the player, as almost every rule you've been taught, both in and out of combat, is undermined or subverted, which is made even tougher as you're denied access to basic functions. Breaking the player's understanding of the boundaries and placing them outside their comfort zone is a potentially game-defining experience, but here it undermines progression. While A's defeat brings with it a credit sequence, the game isn't technically over, as a majority of the content takes place after these events, which is a neat way to circle back to my opening statement, wherein I mentioned the, uh, questionable video game portion. Almost everything that occurs after Analog Man is filler. The cast of Digimon Adventure rock up with their monster companions, and a bunch of series antagonists follow closely behind, but it all amounts to very little, with no weight and minimal reward. Outside of references, these encounters are largely interchangeable in not only a narrative, but also a gameplay sense. Interaction outside of card battles boils down to moving between towns on a dinky little map, and speaking to NPCs with core progress coming from clearing arenas. The gameplay is very one-note, and a bit mindless, with Analog Man being the only real highlight due to the immense bump in difficulty and bizarre events surrounding him. 
having this encounter halfway through the game was silly, as it's the ultimate battle to decide the fate of the digital world, and everything that follows pales in comparison. This is partly due to the restrictions of a collectible card game, as all enemies are bound to the same rule sets and card pools as each other, as well as the player. They also adhere to the same qualification metrics, as enemies have their own ratings in attack, defense, and digivolution speed, but these don't really tell you much or work to distinguish one character from another. It also highlights the type of deck they use. The possibilities are Fire, Ice, Nature, Darkness, and Rare, as well as option cards, which are effectively... effects. Types have differing characteristics. For example, Fire brings a strong offense, while Ice has a higher health pool, and their abilities often counter one another. Nature is fast to digivolve, and Darkness has a bit of something for everybody, but it's slower to get moving. Rare is the wild card, and doesn't have any particular strengths, it's really just a clusterfuck of gimmicks. Deck building's fairly standard for a collectible card game, but there's also an auto build option, which is subject to some loose specifications, and while this might assist players who are unsure of their judgement, the build quality is about as good as a Chinese pandemic. A match of digital card battle opens by randomly assigning turns. You're given a choice of two face down cards with corresponding turn orders, and their locations randomised each time. I'd say that starting first is better as you get two turns and only have to endure a single combat phase, but the opposing player will get the first attack, so there is a benefit to each. At the beginning of each draw phase, cards are picked up until the hand's full. If a player is unhappy with their selection, they can mulligan, which involves discarding the entire hand, then drawing four more. This can be done as long as a deck contains a single card, but due to the low deck size, you'll mill yourself pretty quickly. Unlike most games, being unable to draw isn't an immediate loss, but having no cards to play almost certainly will be. Then it's time to play a monster. There are three main types of Digimon, Rookie, Champion, and Ultimate. This game doesn't feature the Mega stage, and relegates a lot of actual Megas to Ultimate level, so all the series faves can still fit in without having to change the rules. There are also Armor Digimon, but they're not important right now, I'll get to them in a minute. Digital Card Battle follows the evolutionary tradition, where rookies digivolve to champions, then again to ultimates, with a significant stat increase each time. However, you don't have to start by playing a rookie. The game allows you to play whichever Digimon you wish, but at a cost. A rookie will have no penalty to stats, a champion cops a 50% penalty, and an ultimate gets slapped with a whopping 75% decrease in everything. Champions can be played for their initial 50% penalty, then digivolved into an ultimate for a reduced 50% penalty, but ideally you want to start with a rookie and slowly move through the ranks. At least until you get the bullshit cards later on, which allow you to pretty much just win. In addition to being played, Digimon cards have a DP value, which adds to a pool and can be used to evolve monsters. One card can be placed in the DP zone per turn, and upon a successful digivolution, the entire stack is discarded. Once two Digimon are primed and ready to duke it out, combat begins. While turns are alternating, both players interact during the combat phase by selecting an attack as well as a support card. There's also no damage trade in this bad boy. One monster attacks first, and if the other's lucky enough to survive, he gets a turn too. There are three attacks to choose from, circle, triangle, and X. Or cross, I guess, and each has a different purpose. Circle is the strong attack, but it also has the most common counters. Triangle is the balance choice, it does a noticeable amount less than Circle, but isn't counted as easily. It's a safe way to deal some moderate damage. X is the special attack, and typically does the lowest damage, but comes with a secondary effect, making it situational. X can counter attacks, reduce damage, block enemy support abilities, multiply your own damage based on typing, and all sorts of other intricate handy shit. It's a versatile, tactical attack. It's versatactical, fuck, that was, that was such a 2008 YouTube joke. Once an attack's selected, it's kept hidden from the opponent until after the support phase, in which both players can activate a single support card. Option cards can only be used during this phase, but monsters can also be played for their support abilities, adding even more depth to these beasts. Digimon are the most important versatile cards, as they're not only responsible for combat and becoming an expendable digivolution currency, but they can also shift the tides of battle through a more supportive role. I adore how much weight the game puts on basic cards and their potential synergies. 
It gives an opportunity for ostensibly unnecessary or useless selections to shine in one phase or another, and while Digimon support is largely subpar compared to options, it's still an option. Plenty of support effects are dependent upon the enemy attack selection, which is why they're revealed after laying down support, shifting the focus from reacting to an obvious cue into reading the opponent based on their potential actions. Attacks are the only obscured element, with everything else, even the opponent's hand, being visible on screen. This is likely a constraint born of single screen multiplayer, but it also makes the single player far better as a result. It gives both players an accurate understanding of what's in play at all times, and most poor decisions can be boiled down to an inability to assess and adapt. It's not a title where you can pull trap cards and expect enemies to blindly stumble into your web based on the gamble that there may or may not be an unknown counter. While that in and of itself can be a strategic play with bluffing and a whole host of other mind games, I've played enough Yu-Gi-Oh to know it's mostly just broken bullshit. Like, I love it, but it's still broken bullshit. Each decision in Digital Card Battle is derived from available information and the moves you can potentially see the opponent making. Sure, you're still taking a chance in an attempt to outplay the enemy, but the guesswork is immensely reduced and generally based on something. However, there is one cheeky wild card, and that's a blind deck draw. During the support phase, you can pull the top card from your deck and set it face down as support. This ensures you're able to play a support card even if your hand is empty, but also adds the element of surprise, and it's fucking mental. More often than not, as the card's flipped, it either hinders you or does absolutely nothing, but occasionally it'll win you the entire fucking game. And that gamble, despite my prior complaints, is one of the highs of Digital Card Battle. What separates it from other face-down cards in other card games for me is that it's completely random and there is no control over it. However, there is a statistical weight, as the deck's limit is 30 cards, so if you know what you need still in the deck, by the time you get to the support phase, you've got at least a 1 in 26 chance of drawing it, with the odds increasing the more you play. The chance is large enough to make the gamble worth it, and it was a brilliant side effect of having such a small deck. Don't tell... women. Tell them that it's like 180 cards at least. From here, we're treated to a fully 3D battle, in which the Digimon are summoned from their pixelated cardboard and play out their selected attacks. It's pretty decent, there's three unique individual animations for each monster, and if the attack does no damage, the animation is skipped. Oh boy, Pokemon. Been blown the fuck out by a PS1 Digimon game. Again. You can disable the 3D battle scenes, which is a good idea after the novelty wears off, because it reduces playtime immensely. While disabled, it's replaced with these little squiggly diggly effects that roughly convey what's going on without the huge time sink. It's a much appreciated addition. Once the Digimon's health reaches zero, they leave play and the victor gets one green light. The first player to successfully clap three Digmans is the winner. That's Digital Card Battle's rules in a nutshell. Now you can forget a bunch of important shit like how to do taxes and your wife's surname because you're on your way to becoming a cardmaster. Obviously, intricate interactions and playstyles are far more dense in the metagame, but you've got the fundamentals, and that's a fun way to waste a couple minutes. At least I hope so. Subscribe for more boring, fucking card shit no one cares about. How combat plays out is largely determined by the AI, which ranges from brilliant ancient Egyptian tier strategist to Digivice on head retarded, and rarely settles in between. While progress is quite easy to achieve, and the AI is more accommodating than ruthless, some moments are genuinely astounding at how awful the computer's plays are. The overall difficulty, again, peaks at Analog Man, and then for the endgame it drops back down to where it was prior, leading to everything feeling dull and samey. The fact that I keep coming back to the encounter with Analog Man speaks volumes about the drop-off. Unfortunately, the entire endgame is just rehashed content with slightly different deck structures. This is where it would have been cool to have a horde of new cards unlocked, or a new antagonist that filled the role of the last guy, but all that's on offer is refighting the same gym several times over with minor variations. There's a bit of fucking around with some evil Digimon who barely makes an appearance, and when you get 300 wins you can battle Black War Greymon, which is kind of the informal end. 
By 220 wins, I'd done absolutely everything outside of collecting all the cards and the partner abilities. So as bloated as the back half is, it still wasn't enough to pad those 300 duels. The only way I see achieving this goal is if you were going for 100% card collection, which you would have to be insane to even attempt. Each enemy has a set pool of cards they'll yield upon defeat, and certain characters need to be defeated in specific, repetitive ways to get their cards to drop. I would not recommend it. There's also a card fusion system, where you can take two and create a new. Any two cards yield a specific result from a preset selection, and before finalising the merge, the outcome's displayed, allowing it to be cancel scummed until you get what you want. Cards can also be fused into partner Digimon for experience, and fucking hell, I just... I haven't talked about partner Digimon yet. So, partners are effectively companions in card form, and gain experience from battles, increasing their stats at set levels, as well as unlocking equipable upgrades, which do all sorts of shit. They are also stupidly overpowered, and use unlockable Digi-Eggs to become Armor Digimon. These are effectively a champion strength monster, but can be heavily customized to be ultimate strength toward the end of the game, and can be transformed into as you play their rookie form for no cost. The drawback is that they can't Digivolve, so if you're armored, there's no upward mobility, but typically the short burst of power is more than worth it. As the game opens, you select one of three monsters, Vmon, Hawkmon, or Armadillomon. I, being a fucking Chad, picked Vmon. Eventually, you're given a second and third partner, and you get to pick between the leftovers and a couple of new additions. It's a neat system which introduces some light RPG elements, but again, it utterly destroys the natural flow and progression of combat, and makes most battles a complete cakewalk. And that's Digital Card Battle, and its predecessor, Digital Card Battle. They're cool little titles that nobody ever talks about because they're scared of my status as King of Games, and they don't want to go to the Shadow Realm. Fucking try me, cunt.